from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress, and I want to welcome you today to the second in our new series, Asian American Literature Today, uh, featuring the four inaugural Asian American Literary Review uh, Electris Fellows. They are Kathy Lynn Shea, Eugenia Lee, R.A. Villanueva, and Ocean Vuong. This new series is an extension of the library's Asian American Poetry Today series that went on for a number of years, uh, and now it includes not only uh, poets and fiction, but also fiction writers. Uh, we had our inaugural reading uh, uh, last fall, so um, we're happy to have you back here in the spring. Uh, I would like to thank former library staff at Rumi Grafalda for developing the old series and including the center in it. I would also like to thank our presenting partners, the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, the Asian American Literary Review, and the Asian American Studies Program at University of Maryland, and specifically Terry Hong and Lawrence Miss Min Davis for helping us champion Asian American writers. And this event, uh, as opposed to our first event, is also supported by uh, poets and writers, and um, we're really thankful to them for doing that as well. Uh, Finally, this event would not be possible without the behind-the-scenes support of the Library of Congress Asian American Association, a staff organization that sponsors events and activities related to Asian Pacific American heritage in the library community. I would like to thank Association President Wendy Maloney and member Kelly Uzawa for all their work on behalf of this series. Before we, be we begin, I would like to ask you to do what I'm going to now do, which is to Turn off your electronic devices uh, as they may interfere with the recording of this event. Uh, I would also like you to let you know that this event is uh, being recorded, and if you uh, participate in the Q&A session, you give the Library of Congress permission for future use of this recording and webcast. And also let me tell you about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and we put on literary readings, events uh, like this, uh, panels, lectures, what have you, uh, all sorts throughout the year. If you'd like to find out more about the Poetry and Literature Center and uh, about the literary events going on here at the Library of Congress, uh, you can uh, pick up our upcoming events listing uh, outside and sign our sign-up sheet. Uh, you can also check us out online at www.loc.gov poetry. And now on to today's event. Our four poets will read in alphabetical order uh, here at the podium for 10 minutes apiece. And then they will all uh, sit at the table and have a moderated discussion with Lawrence Min Davis. And we'll also leave a little bit of time at the end of the event uh, for you to ask questions. And there are books for sale. Uh, so please do, after the event, buy a book, get it signed. Um, Lawrence. Min Davis is founding director and current co-editor-in-chief of the Asian American Literary Review and is overseeing uh, development of its global digital educations project, the Mixed Race Initiative. He is also a consultant with the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Since 2005, he has taught Asian American literature, Asian American film, and mixed race studies for the Asian American Studies program at the University of Maryland. Last year, the Review launched its Electris Fellowship Program, a project to nurture emerging Asian American writers and generate a sense of community across literary generations by pairing established and emerging writers to conduct mentorships of uh, a letter correspondence, or quote unquote, Electro. The fellows just participated in a workshop in this room, and in addition to their exchanges in the in addition to this reading, uh, their exchanges will be published in the review's most recent and forthcoming issues. It is all the kind of effort the Poetry and Literature Center and the library is proud to be a part of. So please join me in welcoming the inaugural AALR Electris Fellows, Kathy Lynn Shea, Eugenia Lee, R.A. Villanueva, and Ocean Vaughn.
Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much uh, to Lawrence for inviting us to this reading and to my fellow readers and to you for coming out for poetry on this beautifully sunny, we skipped spring, we're into summer, you know, uh, amazing day. It's kind of uh, thrilling to sort of tell my mom, oh, I was on the phone with my mother today. I said, I'm reading at the Library of Congress. It's kind of famous. She said, and you're reading there? So, <laughs> um, yes, mother, I am reading here. So um, I have five poems, and what started me writing was um, t the, the feeling that I wanted to um, tell my parents' stories. And they, you know, these were stories we heard around the kitchen table every day, and yet sort of when I look at Vietnam War narratives, um, these stories are what seem to me egregiously absent. So I'm going to read one for my mother, father, grandmother, myself, and then for the world. My mother still dreams of the war. Her great uncle was kidnapped when she was five, and the rumors of the Viet Cong prevent her from ever returning to that place where the wraiths rose from the paddies as she walked alone to school. In sleep, she can't erase her great uncle's image, his kind eyes and hair cropped close. In the summer, soldiers hid in the ditch just outside her home. She knew them from their distinct smell, mui mei, she called it, laughing, that sense of, that American sense of mosquito repellent and unbathed skin that she described as the smell of something burning. She was 13 when the soldiers touched her hair, clipped the strands between their fingers as if to cut them, and perhaps some piece of her too. Soon after, a village girl was raped by a soldier in a dried out gully. She was airlifted to the field hospital. My mother doesn't say, it could have been me, but instead, the girl lived, but could never marry. So my father, um, he was drafted to fight in the Vietnam War as you know a South Vietnamese soldier, and he was, you know, um, he was in the army for eight years, and he was in the Air Force for four more, and. Um, recently was uh, April 30th, which is commemorates the you know the 40 years 40 years since the fall of Saigon. So I kind of talked to my parents about that, and she mentioned um, sort of that day and the chaos and how soldiers were just stripping off their uniforms and throwing them in the streets. And um, the Americans had left um, on April 23rd, and um, a lot of those places where they were unmanned anymore, they were emptied out, so um, apparently my dad got a dresser, you know, like, um, and I said, it's kind of like looting, right? And my mom's like, who's gonna use that dresser? We needed it, you know. So um, this poem's about my dad. Daughter. When I was a child, my father kept watch over nothing. It was my mother who rose from bed. Her face was a flickering fixture. She was a house with a palm thatched roof. She learned to never sleep. The ceiling smelled of cinder. My father kept to himself. I am his daughter, a mirror or a window. I reflect red, which means stop, blood, or danger. I am a bull born in May. I am not meant to be desolate, an evening pulled apart like smoke. One night, I came to understand my father was a private landscape, a man inside grass so tall he disappeared. My father was a soldier. He stayed alive for me. I remember a Christmas Eve. The heater fogged the windows. Our car, an 89 Camry. I sat on my hands, a pile of rags, blessed mortar, fire, and kerosene. We drove home and we crashed. My father was an angry brick, the air a lucent sheet. 
The vapor formed curly cues between us. I marched past him into my room. What is one supposed to say to one's father? I've never found an opening. My father looked human with holes punched in. The place where he worked smelled of gasoline and oiled cement. There were no closets, only a swivel chair where he slept with his arms crossed behind his head. My, my father hardly spoke to me, but he showed me what it means to survive and how to build machines and terrible wings. So this third poem's for my grandmother, who um, I actually had only met once in my life. Um, that original story was of um, kind of my mother's separation from my grandmother when she was 13, and that long separation kind of um, extends to the generation down because uh, we were born in the U.S., so um, the only time I sort of got to see my grandmother was when she was on her deathbed. And this, is, this documents um, my return three years ago um, to a gravesite. Burial. There is the rain, the odor of fresh earth, and you, grandmother, in a box. I bury the distance, 22 years of not meeting you and your knotted hands. I bury your hair, parted to the side and pinned back, your aoyai of crushed velvet, the implements you used to farm, the stroke which claimed your right side, the feeding tube, the toilet seat, the pigs that slept so soundly next to the well, the land you gave up when you remarried, your grief over my grandfather's passing, the war that evaporated your father's leg, the war that crushed your bowls, your childhood home raised by the rutted wheels of an American tank. I bury it all. You learn that nothing stays in this life, not your daughter, not your uncle, not even the dignity of leaving this world with your pants on. The bed sores on your hips were clean and sunken in. What did I know, child, who heard you speak only once and when we met for the first time, tears watered the side of your face. I held your hand and said, Bang wai, bang wai. Ten years later, I returned. It rained on your gravesite. In the picture above your tomb, you look just like my mother. We lit the jaw sticks and planted them. We kept the encroaching grass at bay. So I decided I'm going to read one final poem. So every, um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, what's happening in Baltimore, the, and that it's the idea of sort of uh, power and violence and police violence and authority and how on every Martin Luther King Day, um, I read this uh, speech that he has called Why I Oppose the War in Vietnam, and um, how it gives me a lot of kind of strength and hope because there, here's somebody who's sort of a civil rights leader speaking out for, you know, at the time, my parents. So I'm going to read a piece from that. He says, now I've chosen to preach about the war in Vietnam because I agree with Dante that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. There comes a time when silence becomes betrayal. So um, this is called, um, it's a poem on Ferguson, and it, I wrote it before the no indictment um, verdict came out. Poem for Ferguson, and thank you guys. Once in Long Beach, when my mother said no English, the solicitor told her to go back to the jungle where she came from. She taught me the names of flowers. 
Years later, I learned their names in English. Narcissus, rhododendron, chrysanthemum. The words placed me firmly in this country, though I slipped from one language to the other, amphibian. Once, as a child, I coughed and earached and cried in a new home. Torah, Torah, Torah thundered on the television. War planes dropped bombs like so much weight. My parents slept in that blue light. Their eyelids shuddered. I imagined that light to be another country. What do the men see when they say ni hao and konnichiwa? A police officer once aimed his eye up the length of my leg as I descended the subway stairs. What could I do with my body then? If I inscribed a circle around me, could I make a country of myself? When I was a girl, my mother was handcuffed and placed in a cell. The officer did not cuff her in front of us because we surrounded her like small animals reciting the tricks we learned at school. In Vietnam, soldiers called my grandmother Mama San. She was a lucky one, just one lost daughter and grandchildren who grew limbs in another country where they spoke the language of soldiers. Their eyes shone with the milk their motherland could never afford. Today, I sing the same songs, chorus of my mother's aches, my father a soldier in a long ago war, my brother's voice ricocheting through the phone line on October 10th, when he was held at gunpoint in Liberty Park. Don't tell mom, he says. He wears a black bracelet etched 1010 to remember. Now Ferguson awaiting a verdict. On the street, the eyewitnesses. In the cold room, autopsies. In the courtrooms, diagrams. And Mike Brown's face. And the faces behind the shields. The officers in riot gear. Soldiers touched my mother's hair. My great grandfather was cut down by an American plane. The soldiers did not know who my family was. My mother says, in Vietnam, a life means so little. If smoke is a prayer, I watch its dark rise. If prayers are a way into memory, let me construct a burning image. Let my voice go hoarse. Let me light these damn words on fire. Thank you. My name is Eugenia Lee, and um, it's just such a such an honor to be here um, reading with um, Kathy and Ron and Ocean, and thank you, Lawrence and Andrea and um, and uh, Rob and everybody for for being here today. Um, so we, the four of us, briefly had a conversation about what it means to be um, a responsible poet politically, I think especially since we are so close to Baltimore and it's hard to um, be here and understand that you know we don't read these poems in a vacuum and so um, we've each chosen a piece to uh, read um, in honor and in solidarity of our African American brothers and sisters. So this is a poem by Tracy K. Smith and it's called The Speed of Belief, and she wrote it um, when her father passed, and I just thought it was such a resonant poem in terms of its grief. The Speed of Belief. I didn't want to wait on my knees in a room made quiet by waiting. A room where we'd listen for the rise of breath, the burble in his throat. I didn't want the orchids or the trays of food meant to fortify that silence, or to pray for him to stay, or to go then, finally toward that ecstatic light. I didn't want to believe what we believe in those rooms, that we are blessed, letting go, letting someone, anyone, drag open the drapes and heave us back into our blinding, bright lives. 
This first poem um, is called Every Hair on Your Head, and it, uh, it was written on the occasion of um, Mark Linkus, the musician behind the band Sparkle Horse, took his own life by walking into an alleyway and shooting himself in the heart. And the poem begins with an epigraph from his song, Hundreds of Sparrows. And the song lyric goes, every hair on your head is counted. You are worth hundreds of sparrows. The day you pushed a bullet through your heart, the length of a day on earth shortened by a millionth of a second. That same day, a Nassau satellite captured an image of a dust storm. Chile withstood its 130th aftershock in a week. And I glimpsed a bird twitching on the floor of a Brooklyn metro station. Its eyeballs bulged as if to literally absorb the ocular world, and I shuddered away. For hours, I saw that flinching creature in my mind. I saw hundreds of similar birds shimmering into the station to lie next to it, a quilt of silvery bodies tiled wing to wing. On good days, I want to be saved. Most days, I want every savior in our hell, so they'll know torment in the bloodstream, death's whistling, ceaseless, blurring the cleanest heartbeats. My first time, I was 13. I tested five pills. My stomach barely ached. I ate ramen, lived, solved math problems. But for days before that, I envisioned my body smeared, inside out, a swarthy, dazzling canvas. What I wouldn't give to graze that silence. Did you do it standing up or crouching? Which was the bigger surprise, the gun punching or the angel catching you? Um, this, this book, uh, for better or for worse, outside of my control a little bit, um, ends up uh, collecting a lot of my family trauma and a lot of um, uh, the violence that happened within my own family and um, and the events of this poem are true. It's called Psalm 107. Praise you for that blanket. Praise you for the stranger who draped it over my mother, her naked body perched, pregnant in the snow. Praise you for my father who said he'd kill her if she ran. And for my mother who didn't run like a mannequin or a stupid dog. Praise you for her skin, the color of cold jellyfish, her psalms careening from her throat to her belly, where your fingers, praise your fingers, forged my unformed body. Praise you for my bloodline, for the savages and the idiots whom you love the same. Thank you for the bones you stepped in me to brave this unsettling. Um, this next poem is called, we called it the year of birthing. And so um, every year, instead of doing a new year's resolution, I give my year a word. And um, it's strange how that word sort of applies to a lot of events in the year. And this particular year, I called it the year of birthing. Um, and then my best friend got pregnant that year, and she said, it, that's, it was your word, it was your word, and that's why I got pregnant. And I said, no, that's not why you got pregnant. <laughs> oh, and I should also mention, um, this, this poem begins with a, a quote that's found in the book trailer, which was done by the lovely Jess Chen, who is here, and she's just a fantastic artist. You should go talk to her as well. God handed me a trash bag bloated with feathers. Turn this into a bird, he said. He threw me a bowl of nails. And make with this a new father. God gave some people whole birds, ready-made fathers with no loose bolts. The rest of us 
received crudeness, used mothers. I banged the nails into two planks of wood and marched around a church screaming, Father, Father, until friends appeared, hammering the scraps they were given to make something of themselves. When beaten hard enough, some people scamper into corners sorted with similar beaten people. Others of us, the stubborn, unbreakable humans, weld our wounds to form tools. Then we spend our days mending bent humans or wiping the humans mired by all the wrong fingerprints. The morning the first baby was born in our circle of friends, we hovered over this child who, unlike us, was born whole. You were given a good mother, we said, a good father. Each one of us prayed. We scrubbed our soiled hands before we held his swaddled body. Um, and I'll read uh, one final poem. And this poem um, I wrote very recently. And so, you know, I hadn't been producing a lot of work since this book, but um, it really, I think this All Letter Fellowship was actually very helpful. And my correspondence with um, poet Julie Enser was. Um, fruitful in ways I didn't imagine. We didn't talk a lot about craft, but she gave me permission to, um, I guess, be sad or just feel like, feel okay with not producing work. And she understood the tensions um, of, I guess I went through sort of a, a mild, you know, down period. And, um, and I, I was thinking a lot about, you know, what it means to go into that dark space, whether it's depression or illness and how to come come out of it. And so, um, you know, I did the logical thing, which is turned to um, an issue of Scientific American, where I found this great quote um, and this great article about dark matter and the first stars. And so this poem is called Reionization, and it begins with a quote from uh, that article. About 13.8 billion years ago, just 400,000 years or so after the Big Bang, the universe abruptly went dark. Eventually, this fog would lift, but how it did so is a question that has long baffled astronomers. Scientific American. Not long after the Big Bang, God's first holy call and response, the universe went dark. All that hot bliss of brilliance shut inside a tomb. God second-guessing both let there be and light. We know how the power went out. The cosmos cooled, then birthed hydrogen, which swallowed the glow. The name for that switching off of spark, recombination, depression, tumor. But we don't yet know how the power returned. One theory imagines the first stars banded together and their tenacious light knifed the dark apart. Reionization, resurrection. It's possible then, if we believe our astronomers and angels, that our abyss is temporary, that a young soprano of stars gathers now on the other side to sing the crucified to life. Thank you. Frederick Douglass by Robert Hayden. When it is finally ours, this freedom, this liberty, this beautiful and terrible thing, needful to man as air, usable as earth, when it belongs at last to all, when it is truly instinct, brain matter, diastole, systole, reflex action, when it is finally won, 
when it is more than the gaudy mumbo jumbo of politicians, this man, this Douglas, this former slave, this Negro beaten to his knees, exiled, visioning a world where none is lonely, none hunted, alien, this man, superb in love and logic, this man shall be remembered. Oh, not with statues rhetoric, not with legends and poems and wreaths of bronze alone, but with the lives grown out of this life, the lives fleshing his dream of the beautiful and needful thing. You okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the poem is called Frederick Douglass by Robert Hayden. This poem is um, also, the title of the poem is also a name. It's Socorro, which is my grandmother's name. Think of people who have liberated you and saved you. Socorro. One, grandma's skin the color of chestnuts cracked opened by mouth and her handing me the flesh inside. Pulling the skin around her knuckles, I marveled at its give, its smell of parliament, its thinness like rice paper. Every day, she dared me to arm wrestle, tapping the mattress to her left, rubbing the sheets in concentric circles, clearing off an arena for our elbows. And her right palm always shrouded mine, always gave a little before the kill, before I had to wheel the oxygen tank closer to her side of the bed. <laughs> and she would pull the elastic band back so I could slide my face into the mask, so I could breathe what she breathed, her laughing as I coughed up only air. Two, when Grandpa woke from dreaming of his wife, dead for 12 years by now, he made the sign of the cross against his chest and he sat on his side of the bed. He listened to a fan push air into a corner which seemed that morning sharp with lizards. He made no mention of the house duster she wore in last night's vision. It straps loose at these shoulders or how his wife propped up her right elbow with her left fist, ashes in her knuckles, an unfiltered cigarette at her lips. At breakfast, Grandpa watched the dogs gnaw at their leashes and gave us only what Grandma sang to him all night. Nakalimutan mo na ako. You have already forgotten me. My brother is not here, but his son, my nephew, Pterodactyl, is always on my mind. That's his real name, by the way. I don't care what he says. <laughs> uh, and this, 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 this poem is, is called Balik Bayan. Um, and it's about my brother and his son, and my father and me and my grandfather. Balak Bayan. Name a brother's son pterodactyl, and hold him to the sky, and watch that boy compare your face to his father's, the shape of the eyes, the folds of the mouth. When he brings his forehead to meet yours, you see the mark there, a soft red, same as the bruise between your brother's eyes, gone now, left by your fastball to his face that summer on the front lawn. You told Dad it was nothing and hoped he'd miss the seams, the blood just below the skin. Years ago, in Batangas, Grandpa wanted to see the ocean, so you cut his hair. You took him to the coast and you sat him on the sand. You spoke of salt and homes, and he practiced your names. I moved to London last summer, so being back in New York and New Jersey and in DC has been um, disorienting, to say the least. <laughs> But it's nice to be back home and have Filipino food, even though Pacquiao lost. <laughs> it's a grave tragedy. Um, 
This is an ode to Filipino food in some way. Fish heads. Yanked free at the gills from cartilage and spine, these fish heads my mother cleans, whose body she scales, throws all into salt water and crushed tamarind. At dinner, she alone will spoon out their eyes with her fingers, suck down each pair as we watch. You see, this is why the three of you could never hide anything from me. As though those organs brought her sight to be soaked through the tongue. When I tell her I've tried to make this stew from memory, she warns, don't waste what should be eaten. It reminds me of every delicate gift we have thrown away. Tilapia stomach, best soured with vinegar. Milkfish liver to melt against the dome of the mouth. That after church, a bucket of chicken soon became a bless blessing of wing gristle and skin dark meat no one else wanted to save. We refused to taste her gizzards and hearts fried in fat, and, and mock the smell of pig blood curdled on the stove, wish gone her tripe steamed with beef bullion and onion broth. After my brother and my sister push aside bowls of baby squid in garlic ink, and gag at my mention of ducks in their shells boiled alive in brine, my mother believes I was the only one to share in such things. Which maybe means, she says, in some former life, you and I were seabirds, or vampires, or wolves. Thank you to Lawrence, and to the Asian American Literary Review, and to Rob, and the Library of Congress, and to Eugenia, and Ocean, and Kathy, my brother and sisters in some way, many ways. I'm going to end with this poem. Let's read it together, OK? Um, this side of the room, you have a line, and you will have a line as well. Are you ready? Yes. The answer is yes. yes. <laughs> Today is May the 4th, which is Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. Um, and so that's my Jedi mind trick. You're, you have a line and you have a line. You ready? Yes. Okay. Your line is, the world has always been ending. The world has always been ending. And your line is, yes. 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 <laughs> this poem is for Michael Brown, and Eric Gardner, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Rakia Boyd. Mass. The world has always been ending, I said, and you said. Yes. Today, half lost in the senderos, among its dry brush and thorns. I hear my mother's voice in the rocks. I see in the rust plains and lava bulbs and cairns stacked as markers, her cells massing upon her heart, lungs running riot along her sternum. Soon the nights of marrow talk, of jabs in the seven last words, serum nights with vials, the joyful mysteries, thumbs on decades falling asleep. I light a match with the end of another, warm poisons and gauze for the new year. The world has always been ending. She said, and I said, yes. Today we walk bearing hymnals and lilacs for the gazebo green, for stairwells and chalks drawn to mark the hem of a body. We bring each place its dirge in the shape of teeth, slugs, a tongue pressed to concrete, its fugue scored for sirens and windpipes, pellet guns and bells. We bless the blue of this wide summer sky above our city, for once, let it mean more to us than smoke, more than blood starved of air beneath skin, more than anthems hollowed or a field for stars dying and dead. The world has always been ending. He said, and you said, Yes. Today they are burning the names of the boys they are shooting in the street. This because we and they 
No ashes mean undone leads and muzzles loosened. Floodlights and flares, eyes doused with milk. At the chapel for vespers, a woman holds a globe. She has decked with poppies and birch tar and foil. Her son colors in a book of heralds and dragons. He traces his palm. Now the Magnificat. Now I am down on my knees, sure only that the fires will come again and again. Thank you. so much for being here and for having me. I believe that all art is collaboration, even in solitude. And I thank you for collaborating with us this afternoon. Um, during the fall of Saigon in 1975, the American radio station played a coded message um, for American personnel to evacuate the city. And it was Irving Berlin's White Christmas. Mm. And uh, I wove the lyrics of that song into a remaking of that moment. Um, it's called Obad with Burning City. And Obad is a, a poem between lovers of uh, a morning departure, sort of the morning after. Obad with Burning City. Milk flower petals in the street, like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be merry and bright. He fills a teacup with champagne brings it to her lips. Open, he says. She opens. Outside, a soldier spits out his cigarette as footsteps fill the square like stones fallen from the sky. May all your Christmases be white as the traffic guard unstraps his holster, his fingers running the hem of her white dress a single candle, their shadows, two wicks. A military truck speeds through the intersection, children streaking inside a bicycle hurled through a store window. When the dust rises, a black dog lies panting in the road, its hind legs crushed into the shine of a white Christmas on the bedstand, a sprig of magnolia expands like a secret heard for the first time. The treetops glisten and children listen. The chief of police face down in a pool of Coca-Cola, a palm-sized photo of his father soaking beside his left ear. The song moving through the city like a widow, a white, a white. I'm dreaming of a curtain of snow falling from her shoulders, snow scraping against the window, snow shredded with gunfire, red sky, snow on the tanks rolling over the city walls, a helicopter lifting the living just out of reach, the city so white it is ready for ink. The radio saying, run, run, run. Milk flower petals on a black dog, like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be merry and bright. She is saying something neither of them can hear. The hotel rocks beneath them, the bed a field of ice. Don't 
worry, he says, as the first shell flashes their faces. My brothers have won the war, and tomorrow the lights go out. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming to hear sleigh bells in the snow, in the square below. A nun, on fire, runs silently towards her God. Open, he says. She opens. Um, I, I, I come from uh, an illiterate family of rice farmers. Um, and um, also, like most, many Vietnamese uh, immigrants, uh, my family work in nail salons. And so, but despite this impediment, um, my mother knew the, the power and the importance of reading and writing. And despite not knowing much, she tried her best to teach me. And this, is, this poem tries to capture uh, that moment. The gift. A, B, C. A, B, C. A, B, C. She doesn't know what comes after. So we begin again. A, B, C. A, B, C. But I can see the fourth letter. A strand of black hair unraveled from the alphabet and written on her cheek. Even now, the nail salon will not leave her. I see propyl acetate, ethyl acetate, chloride, sodium, laurel, sulfate, and sweat fuming through her pink I Love New York t-shirt. A, B, C. A, B. The pencil snaps. The sea breaking its little jaw as dark dust blows through a blue-lined sky. Don't move, she says, as she picks a wing bone of graphite from the yellow carcass, slides it between my fingers. Again, she says, and again, I see it, the strand of hair lifting from her face, how it fell onto the page and lived with no sound, like a word written down, I still hear it. Uh, and um, this last poem is dedicated to our brothers and sisters in Baltimore. It's a poem I wrote to myself because often I write I think, uh, to the terrified versions of myself. So, someday I'll love Ocean Ball. Ocean, don't be afraid. 
The end of the road is so far ahead. It is already behind us. Don't worry. Your father is only your father until one of you forgets. Like how the spine won't remember its wings. No matter how many times our knees kiss the pavement. Ocean, are you listening? The most beautiful part of your body is wherever your mother's shadow falls. Here's the house with childhood whittled down to a single red tripwire. Don't worry. Just call it Horizon and you'll never reach it. Here's today. Jump. I promise it's not a lifeboat. Here's the man whose arms are wide enough to gather your leaving. And here the moment just after the lights go out when you can still see the faint torch between his legs. How you use it again and again to find your own hands. You asked for a second chance and are given a mouth to empty out of. Don't be afraid. The gunfire is only the sound of people trying to live a little longer and failing. Ocean, ocean, get up. The most beautiful part of your body is where it's headed. And remember, loneliness is still time spent with the world. Here's the room with everyone in it. Your dead friends passing through you like wind through a wind chime. Here's a desk with the gimp leg and a brick to make it last. Yes, here's a room so warm and blood close. I swear you will wake and mistake these walls for skin. Thank you. So hi, I'm Lawrence. Uh, I'm going to be leading a moderated Q&A for a little bit, and then we will open things up to questions. <coughs> Excuse me, questions from the audience. So I want to start by by reading something short. Um, the the poet Arthur Z, uh, who's um, since 2012 been the chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, wrote this in a letter to Ocean. Uh, he wrote, once Derek Walcott uh, visited my poetry class at the Institute of American Indian Arts. On the car drive over, he said that he thought behind every poet there was someone who said, this poetry is worth doing. For Derek, it was his mother. For me, it was Josephine Miles. Just in case no one has said it to you yet, I say, this poetry is worth doing. And so I wanted to start this way um, to think about mentorship and ask all of you who has said that to you and maybe who have you said it to and think from there about the place of mentoring in your lives and your work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can start. 
Um, Laron Basilar is a poet who is now based in Santa Barbara, California, and um, she was my first workshop teacher um, at Sarah Lawrence, where I did my MFA, and um, I remember I had not written any poems about my family or about, um, kind of, I guess, domestic violence or any of those topics until I met her, and I would go into her office and I would just weep. And she, I remember, told me, um, you can cry now and be a poet later, and that's okay. And I think I, I really needed to hear that. And, um, but I think the person I really wanted to hear that from was my mother. And I was so aware that I was sharing all of these secrets that belonged to her, and I was terrified of publishing them and publishing this book. And um, I think the universe has a way of orchestrating timing in such a way um, that, that it really uh, pushes you to believe that this poetry is worth writing. Because I think um, about a year or so ago, my mother finally became very comfortable sharing her own story with her Korean community and with um, other communities about the, uh, the pain that she felt and the ways that she was able to arise out of a domestic violence situation. And, um, and, and then the year that my book came out, so this came out in the fall, right around that time, she started volunteering in prisons to talk to um, the inmates there and, and, um, and to share her story there. And I thought, wow, um, I was waiting so long for this book to come out, but I think it came out right when the universe knew that my mom could be the one to say that um, this book was necessary as well. So. Um, so it's not fair because Ocean already has his answer. Like the whole thing began. With, so he's just sitting here listening to us. Um, I have, I'm going to cheat and say three people if that's okay, Lawrence. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, when I was in high school, the teacher who, thank you, Mary, um, who meant the most to me in many ways is a guy named Harry Dawson, who I looked up to quite a bit. And he would let me sit in his office and, and, and read poems. Um, and I didn't write any of my own poems, but he was the first person to, to spill ink in the margins of, of my writing and tell me that it was worth reading. Um, and you fast forward years and years and years, and there were three people that mean quite a bit to me, uh, Joseph Legaspi and Sarah Gambito and Patrick Rosal, uh, three Filipino-American writers who, um, they, were, they were trying to make this thing called Kundiman and uh, a collective of Asian-American poets. And I was a part of uh, the, the first cohort, the first group of uh, fellows and I remember them talking to me in Charlottesville, Virginia, in some field somewhere, and it was hot and it was summertime, and it just felt like I had permission to tell other people's stories, and then in the process of that, uh, tell my own. And uh, those four people in my head are sort of a solar system, mm -hmm. and I find myself always in some way in, in relationship to their poems in the world or some memory of their teaching, their memory of questioning me and making me clarify what I believe and figure out what I'm trying to explore. Uh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm very grateful um, to Arta for, for saying that. Um, oftentimes, I need to hear that uh, more than I, I believe I do. Um, I also think it's important to ask yourself that question every day. Um, I don't think one, any, any singular act can be enough to, to sustain someone through an artistic practice. And give yourself, I think, permission um, to say, is it enough? Is it worth it? And I think it might be helpful to, to allow oneself to say no, <laughs> if that must be the answer. And for me, the, the answer has always been yes. But I think it's important to keep asking ourselves 
Is it worth it? Is it worth doing? Can I do it better? In whatever practice we do. And also give us a forgiving way of stopping uh, if the answer is no. Um, I think the people who first sort of brought me to poetry were people I didn't know. Um, so um, a very important person in my life was Sharon Olds. And um, before I knew her, I knew her poetry. And the poetry gave me sort of this um, sense of identification because she wrote about rape. She wrote about... Um, you know, the body and um, women in such a way that it kind of simultaneously helped sort of reflect my own experience, but push um, for me um, where the boundaries were, what I could say or what I was allowed to say. And um, so when I had the opportunity to, you know, when I was presented this opportunity to study with her, I mean, I, I, I mentioned Earlier, I was a high school teacher in, um, in LA, and I, I sort of felt like this part of me was neglected. But actually, my LA life was quite beautiful. You know, it was sunny, and you know, um, you know, I could go, I could dip into mom's house and eat any time I wanted to. It was great. Um, but I did have this yearning to sort of like this person who has been this kind of north star or whatever mm -hmm. it is, sort of guiding me along. I can be at the table with this person. So I mean. Um, she once told me, so I did go study with her, she once told me, um, I brought in a poem and I was, you know, I cried, you know, I'm a crier, so I cried in workshop and she told me that, um, you know, she told me, thank you, I haven't been writing for a while and that's not something I'm used to and that after I read my poem she wrote one that night and I think that was um, sort of, you know, a moment of terror, you know? <laughs> but um, I guess when we think about, when I think about mentors, I, I think of, I, I'm more comfortable with lateral community than sort of like vertical community because like, at least in my household, like my mom, even though I joke with her, she's like the person you sort of like look up to. And I'm more, I feel more comfortable with seeing everybody as a peer. So people who are sort of like up there, I, I don't mind taking a class with you, you know. I don't mind to like hanging out for a little bit, but then I want to leave you to toward, toward, um, to your life, you know, and read you in a book or something. And then like these uh, these kind of like peers are the ones who I feel like are the ones who we mentor each other. So even if it's somebody who's like 10 or 12 years younger than me, I still see them as my peer. And the encouragement, I think, comes from seeing people as like artists together or writers together and struggling together. I can never figure this out. Turn it off. It, it off. makes oh, noises. Doesn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> turn it off. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as an aside, I want to say how great it is that my parents are here today. Oh. Oh. Way to go, parents. Thanks for Lawrence. They, they, <laughs> they come to all of my events, but I don't remember to thank them for it. So oh, I'm, making, I'm trying to make amends now. Uh, and, and thank you for everybody for coming. Uh -huh. um, so as we have four Asian American poets here at this kind of important cusp early in your careers, I feel like this is a moment to talk about the state of Asian American poetry <laughs> writ large. And Ron, you mentioned Kundiman, and I feel like that's you know, one place to think about what's happening in Asian American poetry over the last few years, what's happening now, and think outward about where Asian American poetry is, fits in a kind of larger poetry landscape. And I, I know that's a kind of nebulous, open-ended question, but I just want to see where that goes and see what your thoughts are on Kundiman and on um, your sense of the state of Asian American poetry from where you sit. When I, when I found out that we were reading at the Library of Congress, there was this moment where I thought that my family imagined that I'd be reading at a joint session of the House of Congress, <laughs> and that I would be giving the, the, the State of the Union. <laughs> and so what's that, what's that piece that the president is sort of traditionally says, like, the state of our union is good. 
And uh, that's my attempt to give the State of the Union. I think, I think we're in a really amazing place. Um, I have, in moving to the UK, you have to make judicious decisions about what you will ship with you, what you will carry with you, what you will try to sneak through customs, and on and on. I shouldn't be saying that in DC. <laughs> uh, but but I, I made this decision to carry with me the books that I thought I could use in classrooms. Uh, the books that were not available there that could be, that could document what was happening now. And that's not just uh, in terms of Asian American writing, but across American writing, contemporary writing. But I found myself carrying with me chapbooks and books from, from these writers who, if I wasn't friends with them, I'd still need their books in my life. And I think we are at a very crucial and pivotal, pivotal, pivotal place in American writing where we have the chance to look at what's actually being made. This is not promising, this is not potential. We are doing this work and we are making these books. Um, and it's not just Kundiaman, it's Vona, uh, it's Kave Kanam, it's, it's, it's Kantamundo. These are, these are communities that are trying to show the world what we have been doing. And we're, and we're asserting a place in American letters that you can no longer deny. It's not easy work. It's not finished work. But uh, it is the work that we must do and that you as readers need to recognize and have in your lives. The State of the Union is good. And it's, get, and it's getting better. That was very well said, but I, I, I have to agree. Vote for me. <laughs> uh, indeed. Um, I think the place of American poetry is also the place of any poetry is perhaps to create more places. The poem is a place where we can be more fully ourselves, the selves that we often forget or are ashamed of or afraid of. And to be a, an American outsider, someone living on the margins, oftentimes uh, we wonder where we can really be. Where can I be safe? But I think at the heart of it, every human being asks that question. And Asian American poetry is succeeding, in my opinion, because it is asking that question. And it's in that asking, it's creating more places for us to be, even if those places are brief and tenuous. It is a moment of possibility. Language has to be carried by a human being. Otherwise, it dies. The same goes with poems. And for many Asian Americans, we arrive at the art through great loss <coughs> of land, culture, language, right. and people. And so, when we're writing the poems, all of us here, and many of you, when we put them into books, when we, when we hold them in our bodies, we are carrying the continuation of a lineage. Not only one of, of Asia, but a human lineage, which is the lineage of storytelling. As much as and I think that's an inexhaustible place to hold. The book can only hold so much, but the human mind can hold all the stories and then create new ones. That's the gift of Asian American poetry and poetry in general, is to create another world when this world is not enough. 
I feel very grateful to be able to create alongside these, these poets. Did you want? Oh, I have notes on my hand while people are talking, so <laughs> I, it helps me to clarify and like, you know, when I blank out, I have something to say. Um, so what's interesting is at least, you know, this was, you know, whatever numbers are, but, um, you know, less than 1% of all anything published is by an Asian American writer. So it's, it's a big deal that we have um, organizations like Kundiman. Kundiman is, was created in 2004 as, an, as a kind of this desire to mentor um, young writers so that, you know, something to proactively change that. Mm. Um, and instead of sort of looking at organizations out there or institutions out there to recognize us, it was this idea that we're going to recognize ourselves. And in doing so, like Ron said, becomes, you know, voices that cannot be ignored. Um, the Asian American Literary Review is also a great journal right. that um, gathers together um, voices that are creative and, and thinks about them through scholarly lenses and sort of looks very creatively and um, divergently about what Asian American literature could be. So it's, it is in many ways a place of possibility. Um, for me, I think about um, Karen Anhui Lee is a poet who said, at, she, was, she taught at one of these retreats that we have every summer. And she said, you in the room, we are, we are together the fresh lava onto which that will harden, you know, onto, the, onto which that becomes the land onto which the future of Asian American poets, you know, will stand. That was grammatically way incorrect. But you guys kind of, you, you understand the image, you know, we're like hot magma. We're, well, first of all, I like this idea that we're fresh lava, we're hot, right? But I mean, you harden into land, you, you create something new in this landscape. And, and I believe that that's like uh, amazing possibility. And um, I guess that's, um, you know, Asian American writers, you know, like, as a group are obviously very diverse and divergent and I think that, um, that it's, you know, each, each thing I write I think is an opening of possibility for myself and for other people. Um, that's it. You got it? Um, I agree with everything they just said and um, I think one thing I realized is that I think my idea of Asian American poetry was very small and it took me entering the space to understand what I was entering and how it actually is growing. And I think, like, I met Kathy pretty early on at a reading that we did when we were both students. And I remember looking at her and going, oh, she's an Asian American poet. And she, you know, she looks about my age. I bet we write about the exact same things. Oh my gosh, I should just quit now. And, I, you know, I was really distressed. But then I, when I read her work or heard her work, I realized, you know, wow, there's there's diversity within Asian American poetry. And I was that naive and that I, I, I didn't understand what this landscape was to that extent. And I think uh, when I started to open myself up to this literature and to um, groups like Quindimon, I understood that um, you know, there, Asian American uh, poetry is as difficult to define as American poetry. And it's so vast and so diverse. And I think um, one of the most shocking things about publishing a book is um, how much I expected for you know the emails that you get. I expected for those emails to come from you know young Asian American women, but they don't really come from young Asian American women. And I'm so I have to say that I'm I'm ashamed to admit that I, I'm always surprised when like an older white man or you know somebody else is emailing me saying like I really resonated with your book and I want to I always want to write them back and go why. But, <laughs> but I think I understand. I, I understand that I'm underestimating, you know, the relevancy of Asian American poetry, and I'm underestimating the power that it does have, and, and I'm being humbled every day by its growth and by, um, yeah, by, you know, the fact that we get to be a part of it. I think it's great. So this is where I should point out that Jeannie's book is for sale in the back, <laughs> as is Kathy, as are Kathy's and Ron's, and then you can keep our eye out for Oceans from Copper Canyon next year, and they'd be happy to sign your book for you if you want to purchase a copy. Um, I think 
given time, we should open things up to audience questions at this point. Um, My name is Amelia Bundles, and I'm on an advisory board for poets and writers, so Elliot Figner wanted to tell me about coming out. I'm so glad he did, because this has been a wonderful treat, so I thank you. Now, I'm going, Ocean, I'm going to quote you when I put something on Facebook, and I wanted to make sure that I, I, I left something out. You said, we arrive at the art through great loss. Mm. And then you said, land, art, and something else. And then you said, we are carrying the continuation of a lineage, not only Asian American, but the lineage of storytelling. That's a gift to create another world. One world is not enough. I think I got most of what you were saying, but you said, we arrived at the art through great loss, and you said land, art, and some, something else. Language. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> great question. <laughs> <laughs> it was profound. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. Thank you, everyone, for the excellent reading and discussion. And, um, I especially want to thank you for reading words that weren't written by you, but you decided to bring today due to the relevance of what's happened in Baltimore and in other areas of the country. I really, really appreciate that and find that important. And so I guess my question is along those lines about the relationship between poetry and politics mm -hmm. and what you see poetry perhaps bringing to political discussions or movements or work um, that perhaps isn't able to be reached or able to be accessed through other forms of dialogue or other forms of interaction, whether that be through activism or through academia. Um, and I think that I get a sense that perhaps Ocean already anticipated that answer to my question by saying that poetry can open different spaces. And I'm wondering what those spaces can be, especially if they're tenuous, if they're short-lived, if like, you know, all of these political events sort of just disappear into the ether or into the traffic of media. You know, what happens right now in Baltimore after we hear six officers are, you know, indicted, does that mean that this is, that, that this is the time for poetry and what can poetry do now? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yesterday I was listening to NPR and it, it was like one of those moments where I'm in the shower and I just turned it on and so I, was, I don't know who was speaking but it was a writer and the writer said for years I wanted to be a journalist but I realized that as a journalist I couldn't tell the truth so I decided to become a writer instead <laughs> and um, I, I often feel that way that I think poetry gives us a medium through which we can tell the truth um, that's all. <laughs> I'm just going to say, um, I think, like I mentioned, what brought me to poetry was my parents' stories and this idea that I wanted to, you know, um, I was in undergrad, it was very compelling to me to read about poets who, you know, you know, we call poetry of witness, right? Po poems that bear witness to historical events. And um, I actually talked to um, a friend, her name was Jennifer Tamayo, and she said that her professor at the time, Mark Strand, told her, told the class, don't write about war, you know, because if you write about war, your your poems won't age well, you know? Like those those poems, one day will they'll, they will lose relevance. Um, so I think there is, a kind of idea about um, some idea out there that you know poetry is like beyond time, but for me, I think that um, in terms of the um, when I think of when I think about poetry of witness, um, poetry time to me is slower somehow than media time because um, you know periodicals sort of. They report what's now, but sort of what's now feels sometimes they, it dissipates because you need to move on to the next piece of news or next piece of um, next thing that of for of for that day, right? But but poetry time moves much more slowly. So um, I think the lessons that you distill and learn in in that it kind of has a longer sense 
for me, of commemoration and witness. Um, I'm not that, I'm pretty sure they'll pick up where I leave off, I'm hoping so. <laughs> to call something political poetry suggests that not all poetry is political. It suggests that not all art making is political. It suggests that all language isn't political. Mm -hmm. Every time you make a choice to, to express yourself, you are making a choice not to express yourself another way. And so that, that suggestion that art can be ahistorical, mm -hmm. decontextualized, is convenient. It is a dodge. It is an evasion. And so I think. Um, when you write poems inside a moment, which is every moment, I suppose, every, you, you write as best you can. You try to give form to the truth and the questions that are leading you toward a truth as best as you can. And for this particular moment, the species of policy or politics or that some of the poems that we read tonight are, are, are reflecting on this moment. Everything we've written tonight is political. Everything, it's all, it's all politics. It, it all, because you're, you're it's giving, um, because you are excluding and you are including all at once. Right? And so there's a responsibility that you have uh, as a writer, I think in some way to, to do your best, to do your damnedest, to reckon with what is in front of you and to confront and to understand, and that's the best that you can do. I don't think that um, we write to be spokespeople. We don't, we're, we're not here to, to speak just for everybody or all of Asian America or all sons and daughters of immigrants and, and on and on and on. We, we, we are writing the poems that we need to write and we're trying to build the relationships with the histories that are as fraught as ours. <laughs> I think that's a good place to stop. Thanks so much to all of our readers and to Washington. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.